All right, Zig coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have Yako and Agata of Melt Banana. Melt Banana is a Japanese noise rock band that fuses extremely fast, hardcore, uh, experimental, uh, electronica, noise pop music to make a blend that is uniquely them. They have toured with Mr. Bungle, the Melvins, Tool, and collaborated with John Zorn and Mike Patton. And they have also recorded with the great Steve Albini. They are an incredibly unique uh, voice in the world of music. One that may not be for everybody, but uh, what really sold me on them was seeing them live. I saw them at the Grog Shop, and it was an experience like no other. Melt Banana has a new album coming out. It's called 3 Plus 5. It's their eighth studio record. And uh, we're going to listen to a tune off it. This is a uh, flip side off 3 Plus 5, Melt Banana. Flip side is the tune. Melt Banana the Band, 3 Plus 5 the album. The album comes out August 23rd. It will be available on all streaming platforms. And before we get into this interview, uh, this interview was an incredibly unique interview. One like no other I've ever done before. And uh, maybe one like you've never heard before. So just to kind of like set the tone of how I was approached with the interview... um, the I have a guy who sends me interviews with his clients, and he was like, uh, Melt Banana being one of them. And he I was like, oh, these guys, uh, they're coming out with a new album. They haven't been to the States in eight years, so their English isn't uh, is, uh, up to par for interviews. But they have a solution, which is you submit questions to them. They are going to use a program to um, an AI of sorts to audio... Uh, to take English, to take English, change it into Japanese, and then change their Japanese answers into English audio and submit it back. And uh, it's really, uh, it's going to sound a bit weird, but it's pretty on par for the band. And I was, uh, I was like, yeah, let's do it. What can, uh, what can that look like? What, what can go wrong? <laughs> How cool can that be? Let's try this out. And uh, so, uh, diving into the to the music that I was sent, and then diving into their career like I would for anyone else, it's like, oh my god, these guys are incredible. And uh, then I saw they were playing at the Grog Shop a couple weeks later, and caught their show at the Grog, and that really sold it. Like, the whole room erupted. It was insane energy for, like, an insane music. You guys just heard the example. Like, a, just a nonstop wave of people moshing. It was incredible. Um, so I bring that all up to say that... This interview you are about to hear sounds very, very strange. And uh, the tones that are used for uh, the, are used are ones the bands chose. I received an email saying that they could potentially change it to make it a little more understandable, but they wanted it to sound this way. They, they picked all the tones of the, the English generated uh, ant- responses to the questions I sent them. And, uh, so it was very, it was very, it's very strange, uh, sounding interview. But if you can get past it, I think they really are sharing some insights. And uh, it was a really fun chance to get to chat with this legendary band. And uh, it was weird. It was weird for me to respond to, to try to have a conversation um, with uh, with a robot-y sounding voice, and to hear the ha-has and laughs was really kind of uh, AI takeover off-putting. But uh, I think it came off okay. You guys be the judge of that. Um, the band, it, it turns out this was more uh, uh, time-taking than they thought. So this is going to be a trial. This may be the only interview they do like this. And this may be the only podcast and interview they do on this tour. So if you guys like hearing from Melt Banana, please share this. Uh, dive into it. Uh Give the uh, give us some feedback so I can send it back to them saying that people like hearing what they have to say in this in this format. And if not, they'll figure something else out. Uh, but I do think it's important that this band uh, gets heard and has a has a outlet to do so. So uh, yeah, keep uh, if you dig it, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast and any of the podcast platforms. It really helps me keep talking to cool guests like Melt Banana and share an insight with you. Um, and it also is going to give us feedback to let them know if they should find another out or keep doing it. Before we get into this conversation, I also want to point out that when I saw uh, Melt Banana at the Grog Shop, the Flying Lutenbachers opened for them. And the great Weasel Walter um, 
uh, destroyed the stage. Uh, so if you dig, if you dug Weasel's music, I did an interview with him uh, a few years ago when he was touring with Lydia Lunch. Um, so if you go in the archive here, you can check that conversation out. And uh, here we go. We're going to get into it. It's going to be weird. It's going to sound strange, but this is my conversation with Melt Banana. Well, to start it off, um, Yako, how did you meet Agata? We both went to the same college and that's where we met. I'll skip the complicated explanation, but in short, she gave me a ticket to the show she would play on campus. We didn't know each other, but I was interested in her band, so I went to see the show. She was a singer. She was throwing chairs at the audience. It left a strong impression. Yeah, throwing chairs in the audience would definitely uh, grab my attention, too. How did uh, music envelop your life? How did you come into music? Was music in the family? Did you grow up around a family that played music? If so, what did that look like? When we were kids, it was a trend for parents to have their kids learn music. I took marimba lessons, and Agatha learned piano. Neither of our parents played instruments, but my mom used to hum a lot. Maybe that's why I've always loved singing since I was a kid. My family didn't play instruments either, but my parents loved music and always had the radio records playing. I have an older sister whose friends listen to some weird music, and I used to borrow cassettes from them to discover new sounds. What inspired the name Melt Banana? Andy Warhol's banana art from the Velvet Underground album. That's a, that's a really cool, subtle tip of the hat. Um, can you tell me about opening for K.K. Knoll? Around the time we were shaping up the songs for our first album, we had a chance to play a live show with K.K. Null. I really wanted him to see our performance, so I asked him to watch us. After the show, I gave him a demo tape that led to him releasing our first album on his label. Can you share with me your guys' experience working with the late, great Steve Albini on your album Scratch or Stitch? We recorded our first album, Speak Squeak Creek, with Steve too. So, Scratch or Stitch was our second time recording with him. This was back in the 90s when he was still recording in his home studio, which was in his basement and attic. We played in the basement, and Steve would be in the attic mixing, giving us cues in broken Japanese. Steve's home studio felt really relaxed, like recording at a friend's house. He had a cat named Floss, and I remember having so much fun playing with him during the recording. What wisdom did you guys glean from working with Steve Albini that you find yourself still um, calling back to today? Recording at Steve's place made me think it would be nice to have our own recording studio at home. I think that's why we started recording all our albums ourselves after working with him on two albums. When we were working on our third album, we asked Steve what mix and compressors we should buy, and he gave us a list with some recommendations. While it's not directly from Steve, I think his influence is a big part of why we ended up doing many things ourselves. Some of those, like, practical things you would never, like, kind of chance upon yourself unless you worked with someone who was a wizard like Steve. That is a great insight, I think, to take away. And it's one of those things that, like... When you're using this tool, you're bringing back their, like, wisdom and approach in a way that uh, you can only get from working with someone and understanding how their hands would kind of craft the tool. That's really that's really cool. Um, so recently I've got to interview the great Lydia Lunch and, um, and even work with her on some stuff. Yako, um, you stated that Lydia is an influence and the No Wave movement was an influence. Can you tell me how the uh, No Wave philosophy and Lydia's music affected you? Hearing the No New York compilation was a shock. It changed how I thought about music. I've come to realize that it's not about wanting to make this or that kind of music, but about making music that has originality. I started using a slide bar after listening to No New York. Also, when I saw you guys at the Grog Shop, you had the Flying Ludenbachers open for you, featuring the great Weasel Walter, who uh, toured extensively with Lydia in Retrovirus. Really? We didn't know that. If we'd known, we could have asked him about it during the tour. We had met him a long time ago but had never really talked much. It was great to talk to him and get to know him better on this tour. Yeah, I don't think it's something he would just bring up. I think you would have to bring it up to him, which is cool. That's just the type of guy he is. No bragging. Um, Yako, I read that you switched to uh, singing in English because 
the English language fit your singing style better? What aspects of English were more efficient for your singing style? The pronunciation of English is very different from Japanese, but that fits my singing style better. It's all about the consonants. I also read that you uh, enjoy messing around with the theremin. Does a uh, playing theremin or messing around with theremin help you come up with melodies? No, it doesn't. But the theremin is a cool instrument. It's too difficult to master, though. Ha <laughs> ha. It is a very difficult uh, instrument to um to master or even gain slight control of. I definitely agree with that. The laugh, the laugh is so weird. That's really reminding that uh, we're doing this in a really strange format. Um, I gotta to uh shift it to you for a minute. Um, you said you get influence from video games, playing games, and uh, video game music. What video games have recently sonically inspired you? Recently, Subnautica was really interesting. It's amazing with headphones on. Kind of on the topic of um, video game music or music that inspired video games, were you guys ever influenced by YMO? Not really. At the time, I thought it was a strange band. For me, yes. My older sister used to play MO records all the time when I was in junior high school. I think I know many of their early songs. I came across their music like a year ago and their story and how it's in, intertwined with the video game music world. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, Agata, I read that the first instrument you bought for yourself was a Roland, was a Roland Juno 106 synth. What led you to uh, abandon the synth and focus more on guitar? I thought playing guitar would get me into Yego's band. Seriously, if I had shown up with a synth and asked to join, she probably said no. I love how it's been like focused to be in the band, be in the band, be in Yako's band. Like, I think that's really cool because like so much of music is just playing with other people and the excitement comes from being in a group with someone else and getting behind something that you guys believe in. So that's, that's really cool. I think that's an awesome reason to toss the synth aside. Um, I noticed when you were playing at the grog shop, uh, when you were playing guitar, your thumb was like way below, like almost your thumb curved around the front of the guitar. I haven't seen anyone play like that where you, usually thumb is kind of anchored in the back or up top like Jimi Hendrix, but yours kind of curved around and joined your fingers on the fretboard. Um, my question is, is that a style approach uh, is that helping you bend notes, or is that just how you got comfortable playing? Haha, <laughs> someone else also asked me the same thing before. I don't really know the proper way to play guitar. It's just comfortable for me to play that way. <laughs> uh, the robot laughs. They're getting to me. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. You know, uh, everyone's got their own way in which they're comfortable playing and that's going to bring out the thing they're trying to get. And it's like uh, those guys, the people that play outside of the box are the ones that change it that everyone else tries to learn anyway. From Django's approach to, uh, to Hendrix's approach, it's all because of how their hand felt comfortable. So that makes sense. Um, when you guys played, you had a lot of sound for a duo. Uh, was the transition from playing to a duo from a full band difficult and uh, what did that look like? I don't really remember. It was about 10 years ago. Of course, it was tough. At first, I thought we could just use a computer and bring only a computer, one microphone, one guitar, and pedal boards to the shows, but it wasn't that simple. Now we had to make drum and bass sounds, samples, and second guitar sounds ourselves, and carry a lot of back lines, so it's just as hard as when we were a four-piece band. Just as much gear to carry. Bummer. Um, so, did that affect how you guys wrote? Did uh, writing come differently now that you're writing all these different parts? I don't feel that way. I've always written the drum and bass parts and programmed them, so the songwriting process hasn't changed much. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense if you're coming into it the same way you've always had, just bringing all the gear now. Um... Did opening for certain acts affect your songwriting style? Didn't, like, opening for Mr. Bungle uh, affect how you guys look at music? I was a bit narrow-minded before touring with Mr. Bungle, but after the tour, I became more open-minded. Before touring with Mr. Bungle, I wasn't interested in playing an instrument well at all, but listening to their amazing performances every night made me want to play better. 
This allowed me to do different things in our songs and expanded my range of expression. And I, I think that range still extends to what you guys are doing today. Um, I really dig the new album, 3 Plus 5. Uh, your eighth studio album that's coming out in August. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me about the song Scar. Thank you. Scar started as a very simple demo I made with a looper on the guitar. I added drums, bass, and new arrangements to shape it up. The structure is a bit complex, so I thought it might be hard for Yako to add vocals. But she came back with such great vocals that I was really surprised and happy. I thought I might have added too many vocals later. Agatha's tracks are challenging. Another one I really like is Stop Gap. That's got some really cool, really cool guitar, at least what I think is guitar. Can you tell me about uh, some of the process on recording Stop Gap? For this song, I wanted to try to use step sequencer effects with the guitar. I played around with the demo and built it into a song. I'm not sure if people agree, but I realized that using step sequencer effects on the guitar could create a similar effect to using autotune on vocals, which was fun and led to the final arrangement. We played it live many times, trying different versions, and it finally took shape. I'm glad we settled on the current version. Uh, another tune I really dug was Seeds, and at the very end of it, there's this uh, there's this synth lick that sounds like the uh, Mario game complete. Was that a hidden video game reference? I wasn't really thinking about Mario, but the trumpet-like sound in the intro made me think of arriving at a castle in an RPG. This song reminds me of Christmas for some reason. That's cool. I think it's like one of those things where, you know, everyone's got their own perception of what's going on and there's no real true definition to a thing. Um, one thing I noticed when you guys played at the Gronk shop, you, you like you set up all your stuff near the lip of the stage, like right in it. Do you guys always play that close to the edge? Yeah, that's pretty normal for us. I didn't realize it was something noticeable until you mentioned it. Yeah, who always tries to balance the instruments on stage to get just the right balance when she hears them around the front of the stage, in the middle. So setting them up in that position is just right. And uh, it's kind of a daring place, I think, to, uh, to um, perform, because when you guys started, the room erupted. There was a nonstop mosh pit, people just throwing, bouncing. There was crowd surfing at the grog shop. And for listeners, if you haven't been to the Grog Shop in Cleveland, Ohio, it's not a high stage. It's not like you're, you're jumping off into anything. There was people climb, scaling the roof. It was insane. Um, so if that's a Sunday night at the Grog Shop, I got to imagine, and I hope the answer is no, but I got to imagine there might have been times that being that close or into the crowd has uh, um, been a bit scary. Have there ever been times where you guys needed to step back? At the Obscene Extreme Festival in the Czech Republic, I did step back a bit. A lot of people got on stage, dancing and stage diving, so we couldn't play that close to the front. But the security and the crowd were used to it, and no one damaged the equipment or bumped into it after all. It was a lot of fun. When the crowd isn't used to stage diving, sometimes people fall onto my pedal board, unplug cables, or spill drinks, causing the sound to cut out. But most of the time, people are respectful and know how to have fun, so it hasn't been a huge problem. Once in the UK, someone, probably drunk or on drugs, dived to the computer and the computer fell off the stage onto the side. The sound stopped in the corner of the computer got dented, but we could reboot the computer and it worked fine. And we were able to continue the show. It was quite a frightening experience. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think most people know how to push around and bump into each other and have a good time. Um, but that's the scary part I'm talking about when the when the gear when the gear's gone, because if for you guys being just the two, if it's gone, the show's over. So that that sounds terrifying, but I'm glad it I'm glad it came back and you guys were able to pull through. And uh, something like that hasn't happened again. Um, one other thing I noticed at the Grog Shop I thought was amazing was you guys covered Devo's Uncontrollable Urge, which uh, for Ohio, it was the perfect cover to do, but also it was a really fun, like fast, aggressive version of it. It was really, really cool. Um, was Devo an influence on your guys' approach to music, or did the Devo philosophy uh, influence you guys at all? Devo's sense of style is great. They're intelligent, fun, and humorous at the same time. We didn't think much about philosophy, but we thought Evo was a cool band and decided to cover their song. 
I think it's well said. Good music's good music. Um, Yako Agata, thank you very much for your time, your insight. I really appreciate you guys taking time to do this. Your music and dedication to being one's true self is, uh, I think, truly inspiring and contagious. And I'm looking forward to what comes next and for everyone to hear 3 plus 5 and relish in this fine form of artistry and musicality, to quote Angelo Moore. Um, so any, anyone who's made it this far in this podcast, this is a very uh, unique approach to a podcast for sure. I would like to uh, re-illustrate that this is exactly how the band wanted it to sound. They wanted their voices to sound a bit strange. Um, but it's kind of on par with Melt Banana's music. And uh, apparently using this AI was quite time uh, was quite taxing on, on their time. And uh, so they, this is maybe the only one they do like this. And this may be the stop of them doing podcasts uh, until they find another way. It's really, you know, it's kind of up to you guys. If you guys dig it, if you can share it around, um, it would help out. And it helped me out. But more, more importantly, it will give a Melt Banana feedback on how they should kind of uh, spend their time approaching their PR and uh, how they should spend their time approaching interviews. And uh, regardless of what, you know, if this is the only one or if there's more to come like this, I think what they have to say is important. I think their music's very inspiring and unique, and I think uh, their voices need to be heard in some type of format. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening and uh, for supporting this at any means. I appreciate it dearly. Um, next week we have Mike Dillon on the show. And that one is not uh, English-generated AI translating Mike's voice from another language into English. It is Mike joining us on the conversation and it's a really inspiring chat and I'm excited to share it with you guys. So uh, until then, have a good week. Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang. Bang.